Hey guys, Joe Pye here, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. Welcome back to the shop. Recently, I got a comment from a viewer that said, Hey Joe, I was using a boring bar in my mill the other day. I dialed in two and I got six on the diameter. What happened? Well, there's several things that could have happened, but my best guess would be uh, probably the sequence of the cuts that you took, the depth of the cuts, and several other factors. I have a animation, a rig set up in the mill behind me that I think will demonstrate quite clearly what I'm trying to convey. So let's take a walk over, take a look at the animation, and this is definitely something that you need to put in your mental toolbox and take forward. All right, let's go. All right, guys, for the duration of this particular demonstration, this white Teflon bar will represent the boring bar, cutting tool, and a vertical reference line in the back. Let's take a look at what happens when this tool comes in contact with the part. The tool is going to find a nice depth that it is happy cutting regardless of what you dialed in because there's going to be flex in the setup, there's going to be flex in the bar. Watch the bar kick out as the bar comes in contact with the workpiece. There you go. You now have the flexion. The tool has found its comfortable cutting depth based on speed, feed, condition of the tool, etc. As the tool passes through the part, watch the deflection. The deflection is now going to return close to, probably exactly back to, the preloaded state. On the way back across the part, when you retract the part, you're going to get some rebound, but not as bad as the first pass because the tool load is minimal. But that small deflection, you can still see it's present. That small deflection is what's going to bite you if you measure the hole now and dial in what you think you need. If that's a three thousandths deflection and you measure the hole and say, oh, I only need to take three more, when you add three more to the setup, you've officially blown that hole. If you were to just take another pass, a dead pass, a spring pass, a ghost pass, whatever you call it in your shop, that is where you should start from before you make your final cut. If this is a production environment and you've got this dialed in and you know how your machines react, well, then you can go from a rough cut to a finished cut and get away with it. But in a manual operation, you might want to be careful about that. Certain considerations for not having this happen. If you're using a boring bar in a rather large hole, well, use the largest diameter boring bar you can use and will avoid the flimsy flex. If you're only boring an inch deep, don't leave the tool hanging out four inches. Get the tool as close as you can to the boring head or to the cutter itself. Make sure that the tip of the tool is favorable for cutting, that it's nice and sharp and correctly ground, and that your speeds and feeds are not going to prematurely smash your tool or burn it up because you're going too slow. Keep that in mind. Let's go over to the bench, go on to a pad, and I'll show you what to expect if you're turning and uh, you have spring in your setup. Let's do it. All right, for sake of demonstration, let's start off with a triangular insert. This is a TPG 321 coated can of metal insert. Doesn't really matter what it is, but that's what we're going to draw right here. And I'm going to draw it large. So let's do this. Base of the insert. Radius. Radius is grossly exaggerated, just so I can make my point here. Radius. Coming back around. There it is. All right. When this insert comes in contact with the material, and let's say it's a boring bar, it's going to come in contact with the material somewhere out in this zone right here. Let's say it's coming down on the part. Okay. You continue to take bites that are that deep, and that is the region of the tool that is going to see the most abuse because you repeatedly are using this area right here. Could be into the flat, could be just the corner, whatever. But this is now your affected zone. When this continues to go in this direction, the part of this tool that's going to show the most wear will be right here. Because after it gets beyond the radius, well, realistically, it's not doing much unless it's a stupid rapid feed rate that's way too tall, in which case you're going to have a crappy finish. 
But as this tool hits this part and this continues to wear out, the pressure on this tool is going to continue to get higher and higher and higher. And when you try to take a fine cut and you have a worn edge, well, you're not going to get what you're looking for. That's problem number one. When you put the part, when you put the cutter all the way through your part and reach the bottom of the part and back out and it cuts, well, why does it cut? Well, take a look at that red line. This is all dull. This is sharp. So when it's coming this way, it's cutting from here up. It's got a fresh edge to cut with. So you're going to get a spiral inside that bore no matter what you do. You can take your tool and you can offset your tool and retract it and come back to zero. But depends on the repeatability of your tool, how accurate your machine is, whether or not you come back and you can get that small little step that you're looking for. But if that small step is within that area of wear, all you're going to get is pressure, burnishing, ratty finish, chatter, and frustration. What's actually going on with the turning operation? I'm going to mimic a relatively heavy cut. This is the center line of the part. We are looking through the spindle of the lathe from the left-hand side. So we are looking towards the tailstock right now, okay? Here's your material. Here's your tool. As the tool penetrates the part, the rotation of the machine being this way, nine times out of 10, forces a downward pressure on the tool. The pressure on that tool causes that tool to pivot about a fulcrum that would ultimately be the strongest part of the setup because it's not going to yield back here. It's going to yield up here, but it's going to pivot back here like a seesaw. So if you have distance from the center to the point of contact, when it flexes, so your tool flexes. I'm going to pivot back here. Grossly exaggerated, of course. Now the tip of your tool is down here. It's still into the part, naturally, because this movement is minimal. But look at the distance. Look at the increase in the distance. So if you load up a tool in a lathe and it flexes down, it's going to cut a larger diameter, 9 times out of 10. When you stop your cut and you track back over what you just cut, you may get that squirrely line in the OD as well. Now, tool load will get you every time. Make sure if you're creeping up on a diameter that the cut before your finished cut is not a super duper heavy cut unless you've proven the process. If you take one big cut and then take another cut thinking you're going to finish it, chances are you're going to get bit. The other thing you need to check when you take a heavy cut and you're creeping up on a finished cut, that once you've eliminated the deflection and taken a small dead pass for measurement, is temperature. Huge problem. Not too many people think about that. You take your cut, you put your micrometer on it, you say, oh, we're good, take another cut, put it on the bench, parts fine, parts to spec. You come back 30 minutes later and it's undersized. What happened? Well, it was hot. It was swollen. You cut it while it was hot, and when it chilled, it was undersized. So if you're splitting hairs and cutting tents, guys, watch out for the temperature of the part. going to make a big difference. Anyway, I hope that sheds some light on why you can dial in 2 and get 10 or whatever. It is the deflection. It is the rebound of the cutting tool. It is the displacement of the material. Sometimes the material will push away because of the wear on the tool. Keep an eye on the cutting edge of your tool. Make sure your cutting edges are fresh and any finished passes are not directly after a heavy pass. Eliminate the flex first. Make sure you know what you got. Anyway, that's all I got for you. I hope that shed some light on a sensitive subject about, gee, I dialed in two. I got six. That's why. Let's just say those two are the reasons why. Tool wear and tool load. That's all I got for you guys. Thanks for spending some of your time with me today. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're well, happy, and safe. All of the above. I'm Joel Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out.
Hey guys, Joe Pye here in the shop. Just wanted to take a minute and say thank you for stopping by. If you are new to this channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up on the material that you like so you can navigate your way back. There's a lot of great material here for the beginner as well as the pro. Been doing this a long time and I think that my videos will probably help you get through your obstacles. Once again, thank you very much. Stop by the web store, check out the swag that we have set aside for the holiday. Consider supporting this channel on Patreon as well. Thank you all to my subscribers. Thank you to my supporters. Thank you to my patrons. Joe Pye, Advanced Innovations, Austin, Texas. I'm out. Ever wonder why they call this a TPG 321 insert? The three is the inscribed circle diameter in eighths of an inch. The two is the thickness in sixteenths of an inch. And the one is the radius on the corners in thirty seconds of an inch. Excuse me, sixty fourths of an inch. So to look at this insert immediately from that number, I know a 3 8 diameter pin will be tangent to all three sides when you lay it right on top. I know that it is 2 16ths of an inch thick, or 1 8 thick. And I know that the radius on the corners, 1 64th, or 0 0.015. There you go. Now you're smarter.